Thank you very much. Okay. So um, this is a 45-minute session, and we're going to try and end with some time for questions. I think you're going to have a lot of questions for Rehan as he teaches you all how to do it yourself. He, uh, I think he's put 50, 60 people at least. I don't know. Hundreds? On, hundreds on, on, on these uh, do-it-yourself uh, loop and, and closed-loop systems, and he's going to really go into that. I'm just going to give a quick overview of where the space is right now. And as you know, closing the loop takes, um, it used to take meters, and now that we have uh, sensors that are approved uh, for non-adjunctive use and you don't need to finger poke, we actually don't need the meters uh, anymore in some of the systems. Um, a pump to deliver the insulin, and then an algorithm that looks at the rate of change, where your glucose is, how much insulin you have on board, and really works to mitigate your risks of getting low and also decrease the, uh, the highs. So. There's been a rapid acceleration in this space, and basically because the continuous glucose sensors just got a lot better, and you can really rely on them to deliver insulin. And you got to remember, if that sensor is off and it's reading high, like you miscalibrated it from a dirty finger, you're going to give yourself a lot more insulin than you, you would want. So it really is important to have a good sensor. And secondly, the FDA has really fast-tracked this over the last six years. And it's, it's been absolutely amazing how they have turned this around. It's due to the lobbying of JDRF and people going to Congress, and they, they've really, really fast-tracked it. You put in an application, and in 30 days it's approved. When um, Medtronic and, and Tandem put in their applications to bring something to market, it, instead of taking six months to get approved, they're getting it done in three months. And, and they've really just made a, a huge difference, and I can't thank them enough. And then it's you guys. It's the diabetes community that has really pushed the innovation. And I think you're going to see that in the uh, do-it-yourself group. But it's really made a huge uh, difference. And I think everyone getting together like this and seeing what can happen is huge. So this is a young dude. In 2002, I started testing with the DirectNet group, the sensors. And you can see he has two of the Medtronic sensors at that time. And this is actually a gluco watch on his arm and his leg. And not, not around anymore. Um, but we have progressed four years later. Uh, the Dexcom uh, three-day sensor came out and had pretty, pr this is 26, the MARD is your percent error, and it was 26 percent error. Not that good, and then the 7, 17, and now the G5, G6 are less than 10 percent, which is what you need for a closed loop system. This is the new uh, G6, and the nice things are no calibration. When they got it approved, they got it approved all the way down to age 2, which is, I think, really important to open up to the huge broad population of type 1. Uh, the new inserter is nice, and this ICGM means integrated continuous glucose monitoring system. So this can be a plug and play with any closed loop system that someone wants to use with it. It's a huge advantage. Instead of having to approve, get a whole system approved, you can take the sensor if it's approved. If you had a pump that it's approved, you can just match them together, and you don't need to rebuild the system each time. Um, this is the ever sense. It's always good to get new. Um, sensing technologies out there. And this is, you heard it yesterday, it's a fluorescence-based sensor. It's implanted. It can last for, uh, in the US, it's approved for three months. In Europe, it's uh, six months, and they're hoping to get a year out of it. And it's really nice, because you can take it off and do the sports and activities, and it's another alternative in terms of a, a way to manage your diabetes. Um, this is the precision of the Eversense, and it's, the percent error is 8.5. It's, it's the best on the list here, which is Great. It does require two cows a day still. The Dexcom G6 is 9.8, and the Medtronic with four cows a day is 9.6 percent. So they're all good for using it. And the Libre is sort of in between at 9.7 there, and again, that could be used for closed loop. So the first one that got commercially approved, as you know, was the Medtronic 670G. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. We did the first studies with it in 2014 at a diabetes camp in Southern California, which is a great way to test the system. You give it to a bunch of adolescents, and they made a lot of changes after that. Um, so is it OK to not? Yeah, OK. So I'm going to give a little bit of info. I got frozen here. This is going to be a very short talk. There we go. 
Is it working now? Yeah. So I'm just going to show the, the quick results. And all of these graphs in closed loop look pretty much the same. These are hybrid closed loop systems, meaning it's controlling your basal insulin, um, and, and it can modulate that. It, they don't have enough oomph to cover a meal. So you have to give some indication that you're eating, give a carb or a uh, indication that you're going to have a meal or they, they won't work well. They, they cannot handle a meal. Um, and some of them have different degrees of giving correction doses. Some the system automatically does it, some it asks you to put in the correction dose. And I think that's one of the big issues in this field is how much control to give to a, an automated insulin delivery system and how much control you want to retain. And I will tell you, we've been studying two-year-olds up to 72-year-olds, and there's a big difference. And uh, the two-year-old has no say. Uh, he just does whatever it happens and it's fine with him. The adolescent, the more it will do, the better off they are and the more happy they are with it. Um, the adult that's had diabetes 30, 40 years, who's really figured out how to do it themselves, they don't like giving up that much control and they really want to see what's going on. So I think we're going to need to have systems that adapt to the individual and there's going to need to be a transition. It's, I always view it as sort of the Russian uh, U.S. negotiations on nuclear uh, weapons. It's sort of trust but verify and slowly move forward. So, so this is the, in red is the uh, closed loop and you decrease the variability. You come in with a nice glucose level. Um, we just went through, th this is the uh, adults. And you decrease the variability during the day and the lows. This is the adolescents, particularly getting rid of the highs after breakfast, but also coming in with really good glucose. And these were the seven to 13 year olds. This hasn't been published yet, but very nice coming down into a, about a 120 in the morning, getting rid of a lot of the highs and reducing the variability. So overall, the usage uh, was greatest in the adults and less in the adolescents, so uh, no surprise. They sometimes forget to give meal boluses and then they get a high glucose and then that gets kicked them out of, out of auto mode. And so they get less time. Using it, all of them, all the groups had about a 0.4, 0.6% improvement in A1C. And in the adults, our goal is to have over 70% time and range, and they were 74%. And the younger kids only got to 65, but they started at 56, so they had a 9% improvement in time and range, which is a, a big improvement. I just want to talk a little bit about severe hypoglycemia for the first in these studies, there were 65,000 days and nights of CGM where it represents about 178 patient years. From the type 1D exchange, we would have expected with a 5 to 6 percent incidence rate of seizures, loss of consciousness each year, about 12 severe lows in this period of time. And in actuality, there were none. And I have reviewed kids and their data for three years now that have been in this study. And I only have one incidence of a bad event where someone had a long low at night. And here it is. This is seven hours of hypoglycemia overnight. And I just want to look at the night before and show you how that happened. So she was running a little bit high. She tested her blood sugar. She's a little over 200 here. She'd had her dinner bolus. And she had that um, where she wanted to give a correction. It said, you have too much insulin on board. So she put in fake carbs, and that's a favorite thing for people to do to get control of this. So she put in her fake carbs, so she didn't really eat here. She got an insulin bolus, and then if you look what happened the next day, she uh, went into safe basal here, then it asked for the glucose to get her out of safe basal, and she was asleep, so she didn't do it. So it went back to its, her usual pre-programmed basal, which actually has an increase at 5 a.m. So she's getting more insulin while she's hypoglycemic for the seven hours. And fortunately woke up, didn't have a seizure or loss of consciousness. But we've looked at people having seizures at night, and generally it takes about two to five hours of hypoglycemia to, to get a seizure. And I've never seen it less than two hours. I, I'm, I'm sure it can happen. But this is just a caveat. If you want to give fake carbs with this system, don't do it in the evening. Because the system is, it works. It will bring your blood sugar down. It will work and correct it by morning. And let it do it and have a good, the reason you're doing this is to have a good night's sleep and a good safe night's sleep without an event like that. Um, this, we just tested it in uh, toddlers. Uh, these are uh, kids using the 670G pump. Um, they're a lot of fun. Uh, we <laughs> lived with them night and day for a week. Um, when you take toddlers out, 
it's do what you want, eat what you want, and if one kid is having an ice cream sandwich, everyone has an ice cream sandwich. And you can see the parents read the label, figured out the number of carbs, um, bolus for it, but you never know how much a kid like that age is gonna eat, how much goes on their mouth, their shirt, how much goes to the dog, the family dog waiting <laughs> below. It, it's, it's, it's a guesstimate. So um, the, at the ADA meeting, um, Scott Lee presented the data of 30,000 patients using the 670G, and it's uh, three million days of wear. That's a lot of data. 79% of the time they were in auto mode, and the mean glucose was 156, which is an A1C equivalent of seven. Uh, the time less than 70 was 2%, which is great, and the time in range was above that 70% mark. So pretty, pretty good. Um, the 670G greatly improves overnight control. Um, you can generally start the day with a good glucose. Uh, it does require calibrations, and I think the problem with this has been they put in a lot of safeguards to keep that sensor and make sure it was accurate, and that has created a lot of issues with calibrations. And I'll show you a little bit of that. They built in what's called impedance spectroscopy, which looks at the current to drive the sensor here. And if that shifts, it will ask for a calibration, even though when you calibrated, it looked like it was spot on each time. It actually, um, that's showing here. So they um, will then ask for another glucose. And if you put two, three glucoses in within about a half hour, it will think the sensor has died and it will, will kill it. So when you ask for, it, for a new glucose, don't do it. Uh, give it one, wait a half hour before you give it another one, and then it will, will generally work. And, and, and they, they change the labeling to get it in 15 minutes, but even ignore that. Go, go a half hour. Um, this is a tandem predictive low glucose suspense system called Basal IQ. And uh, we did studies on this uh, last year. And it, it uses an algorithm, actually, uh, the group, our group and Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and Barbara Davis Center are working on for years. But the nice thing about it, it predicts if you're gonna get low and then it will suspend the insulin delivery and then once your glucose is beginning to head up, it immediately begins restarting your basal. There are no alarms, it doesn't wake you up, it just happens in the background. You can look at the pump and see these red bars, but there's nothing that you have to bother with. So you can sleep at night and it's sort of the low end of a closed loop system. And this is someone that just sort of chattered at the lower bottom. But I want to let you know it was released on Friday. So any of you that have a Tandem X2 pump, you just need to ask your doctor to write a prescription because it's a little change in, in therapy and there will be a video you watch and then it's automatically downloaded to your pump for free. And I think that ability to download to the pump and have free updates means you aren't stuck with one model and then you have to wait four years to get the next one. And I think that's a huge uh, advancement. Um, this is a UVA system, and, and this system's been used on hundreds and hundreds of patients. We've um, gotten hundreds of thousands of hours of data on this system. This is one that used the Roche pump, and it was on an Android phone. And then it moved to type zero, and we did studies last year using this with a, it had, hadn't been published yet, but on an Android phone with the Roche pump. And this year in April, they took the algorithm from that system and put it on the tandem pump. And so we took that to a ski camp to test it in extremes of weather and altitude uh, using the G6 sensor talking to the tandem pump. And now we're in the middle of doing a seven center study um, with the uh, tandem pump, this control IQ, and the Dexcom G6, and we're about probably two-thirds of the way through enrollment at this multi-center study. We plan to have the results in about April next year, and uh, probably for the ADA meeting. And, and I think this will probably be the next system that goes commercial, though there may be someone stinking up there that I don't know about, but um, I, it's gonna be nice. One of the things it does, it gives a correction dose every hour if you're running high automatically based on the sensor. Um, which is, is good. It still is hybrid. You still need to give your meal bolus. Uh, this is the Omnipod platform for those that are potters. And it, we did some inpatient studies. You always start with inpatient and then, you know, four, four day um, Airbnb and then we did five day Airbnb and we've tested uh, all age groups. It's testing using a, a G4 actually. And this is a um, 
a little Windows tablet which has the algorithm in MATLAB so they can adjust it and here's the uh, pod. And this is an adolescent data and again you get the same compression overnight and compression of the variability during the day. The time in range, the mean glucose 153, again in A1C less than 7, uh, less than 2% uh, less than 70. So that, that's really good and again sub, over 70% time in range. Um, we tested it again in toddlers and I really am very proud of these companies for going down to this young age group. Uh, it's not a big market, but it's a very important group to when you have type 1 diabetes. And I think one of the things is here, this was studies we did about a, uh, three weeks ago. Here are these two kids that are participating in the study and if you're a toddler, you don't have any peers with diabetes to compare to in your school or in your life. And all of a sudden you had these families living together in this Airbnb. The kids bonded, the parents bonded like crazy, and uh, maybe too much. I think they were trying to head off this other road here. Uh, <laughs> don't tell me what they're thinking of doing. But here's the mother with the backpack, and, and she has the uh, controller in it, and here's our uh, uh, research coordinator. So uh, it, it was a great experience, and I tell you, these mothers cried in the morning, because for the first time in years, they slept through the night. They're, and when they looked at their kids' glucose values in the morning, they were flat. They were like what Earl Hurst showed you yesterday, just beautifully flat. And I, I haven't seen like control like that in kids this age before. Um, and this is how they empower it, envision it being, this will be a G6 uh, at the time, but this will be a, uh, the pod, and the algorithm will be on this pod, which you throw away every three days. And when you load it up to your, your, P, your handheld device, it will give the new updates on the uh, algorithm to the next pod. So, it's, it's, so all you have to have is these two and you're in closed loop 24-7. Um, this is a system uh, that Roman Havorka out of Cambridge has uh, developed and he's done a lot of studies and it's using a 640G pump for the first time with an N -light, the new N-Light sensor and uh, it will be talking to an Android phone. And what the nice thing about this system is you have full functionality on the pump. You can give uh, a, um, a change in basal rate. You could give a dual wave bolus, an extended bolus, what, whatever you would normally do on the pump you can do. Meanwhile, the algorithm is working in the background to control your glucose levels. He's achieved very good glucose control overnight. Here's uh, 12 adolescents and again during the day. So it really is a, an improvement. And I, I'm looking forward to this study starting in probably one to two months. This is a bionic pancreas which gave both insulin and glucagon. And if you look at the control here, it went from an average of 154 down to 138. These are some of the best glucose values in the closed loop field. And the circles are the hypo, and he essentially eliminated severe hypo in this. So it was very, uh, convincing and so we have now been testing this system in an insulin only configuration because the glucagon needs to be stable and needs to last for um, you know in the pump for uh, at least three days and current glucagon is only good for one day so they're developing that formulation and so that's going to be an extra year added on to the development of this pump. So we want to see how it works within, in the insulin only configuration because it only requires the weight to initialize it. There's no basal rates, there's no carb ratios, there's no correction factors. It rapidly adapts over 12, 24 hours to your insulin requirements and there's no carb counting. You just have a slider, average, smaller than average, bigger than average for your meal size. You just look for you, what's right for you, and then it has meal adaptation built into it. So we um, tested that this, on this configuration, and we, we did it the last three months or two months, and we got one more month to go starting in two weeks or one week uh, with this system. This is, a, this is heavy. This is solid. Uh, and whoops. And this is a new version, which they're making now up the, in Irvine, uh, a few miles up the road here. And it, this is a FIAS pre-filled cartridge, and this will be the glucagon pre-filled cartridge. And it's really a nice thing to hold. It's like an, an early iPhone, very small and, and light. So I, I like it. And this is one of the kids from uh, two weeks ago. And uh, <laughs> diabetics, the only people who take drugs to avoid getting high. Okay, I, I, he's really cute. And this is, um, 
the Bigfoot Biomedical, and they've bought the Asante pump, and they'll have switched and are using a Libre, and they're also developing a system with, with pens for people on MDI to uh, regulate their diabetes. And what we've achieved is, this was the old risk from the diabetes control complications trial, where as your A1C went down, your risk of um, severe lows went significantly up. And this is what having a sensor did, so you could get uh, a lower A1C with a lower risk of hypoglycemia, and this is with a sensor augmented pump, and this is what happened with the 670G. An A1C around seven and no severe lows. So this is looking at A1C levels. This is from 2015, and this is in the United States at major centers. And 9% of kids, uh, I, I mean, of the kids, their average A1C is around 9% in adolescence. You know, adolescence actually goes till you're about 25, 30 years old here. I just want to point that out as forebrain development, not hormonal development. And you can see what the insulin only did. It brought that to seven, if you looked at what the glucose control would be like. And with the bihormonal, it was 6.3 A1Cs. So um, it's, uh, we, it's gonna make a difference. And I think the next major hurdle is to go to full closed loop, to be able to not think about meals. You just walk in, you start, you, you just through your day you eat and you don't count carbs, you don't do any of that. You don't pre-meal bolus. And that's gonna take a combination of things, I think. Faster acting insulins, co-formulations with insulin and amylin, insulin and GLP-1 agonists like uh, you were hearing about yesterday. Uh, and I think we're, we're doing some things with um, an Apple Watch. So if I go like this and I do that twice, there's a 98% chance I'm eating. If I go like this, there's about a 90% chance I'm drinking. And if I go like this, I'm drinking wine. So, um, <laughs> Uh, we, and I think if it can take that hand gesture with the Apple Watch worn on your dominant hand, and that singles the system that you're beginning to eat, you get a bolus. Then as you're eating, your blood sugar begins to go up. Now you have two things confirming that you're eating, and you can really deliver insulin. So I'm really hoping this is going to make a difference. And we can also analyze the glucose curve and determine whether it was a low-fat or a high-fat meal, and that will determine the amount of insulin you need for those burritos that last until three in the morning. So um, this is a, an interesting study, but they gave simultaneously the pramletide and insulin. And this was with a dinner, breakfast, and lunch. And you see this curve is flat. And I think there are companies, I know there are companies working to co-formulate the insulin and the pramletide. And again, that yeah, pramletide is secreted from a normal islet every time it secretes insulin. So this is just physiology. It's mimicking what your body is missing. And the whole point of doing this is to give replacement to what, what's there. This is just, it's, people think, talk of drugs and stuff. Well, this is a hormone your body makes that it's not getting now. And it would make a huge difference to get it. So the future is adaptability basal requirements, meal requirements, giving correction doses automatically, and I think really determining how much you want the system to do for you and allowing you to decide what set point you want, what glucose control you want to have. And um, I'm going to just merge that right into do it yourself, which is I really think at the cutting edge, the user interface is designed by, designed by users. When I look at the data, it's amazing to look at. They've had great platforms that they put it on. And the guy that really knows this well is Rehan. 